everybody, and welcome to Chopping It Up. I'm excited to be here. Tonight, we got Jorge Rincon, or pardon me, George Rincon. Um, I'm excited to have him here tonight, guys. Uh, last night, we had an amazing interview with Jason Day, talking about him being a father and everything. It, it went really well, um, but everybody, we're going to go ahead and roll into this podcast. This is Bryant Lucas. Uh, it's the Cowboy. Plug in that sound striker. Uh, whatever you want to do there. <laughs> Other than that, everybody, let's welcome George Rincon to the podcast. George. Yes, sir. How are you doing tonight, man? It's it's a late Wednesday night. Yeah, it's mediocre here. I'm in California, so it's, what is it, 8 o'clock or something like that? So it's not too late here for me. Not too late. That's not too bad, you know. I'd look at 8.19 over there. Uh, other than that, uh, I ever knew that you were an older racer. You hide that pretty good. I mean, you can only go by somebody's name if they don't talk too much. So you don't That's hear true. you don't hear too much of me on the radio. You never hear me complain. Uh, I typically don't. I typically don't comment on stuff. Only once in a while when I think is warranted. But yeah, um, I'm a young sixty-two. Let's put it that way. A yeah, young sixty-two. Um, hey man, uh, you definitely acted on the racetrack. Um, I always loved racing around you. It was kind of fun. I always thought you were a younger guy and you're always one I was trying to chase, you know, I was like, <laughs> you're fun to race around when I was racing in the tracks. What truck number do you race? 28. The number 28 truck driver in the Speedy Trophies truck series. Yep. Yeah. I do remember that. You always did those old, ske- those, um, throwback schemes. Oh, whose scheme was that that you all always run? Uh, I mean, I did run a lot of Earnhardt stuff. Earnhardt was the guy, senior. He was he was my favorite, and then when he passed, I, I really never tied on anybody else. But I kind of have the Earnhardt theme. I'm kind of doing something different for myself now, though. Well, that's good. That's good. Uh, well, <laughs> not bad. 28's a great number, you know. Uh, I grabbed my jacket. Usually it's sitting here, but I got that number 88. Uh a jacket for Dale Jarrett, you know, 28 kind of goes together with that. Um, well, but, I chose uh, the 28 because my son liked Ricky Rudd. Okay, uh, yeah. Ricky Rudd drove the 28 for a while. He drove the tent for a while, but I actually chose the 28 because of my son. Well, that's good. That's good. All right, let's, 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 let's. So I'm more of the guy who wants to learn about you, learn about your life, and especially with the guys who have uh, had more experience racing. It's awesome to uh, talk about their lives. Um, where were you born? In Hollywood, California. Hollywood. So you've been in California your whole life. Yeah, born in Hollywood, lived there for my first year, year and a half. And then from there, we moved up into a community called Saugus, which changed the name to Canyon Country and changed the name to Santa Clarita. And so I mm-hmm. basically went to three different schools up here. And right now I live in Agua Dulce, which is like a little suburb outside of Santa Clarita. Um, but yeah, I lived here all my life pretty much. And actually contemplating a move here, hopefully within the next six months to Atlanta. I think I'm going to retire and move to Atlanta where my son and my dad and my grandkids are. It's yeah. It's a good plan. Always good to be by family. I understand yeah. that. My aunt lives next door. My grandparents have two more doors down and behind me lives my other aunt. So... I understand being all around family. Um, I it's so nice to be able to like like today. I walked down the street to my grandparents' house and they said, "There's pizza. You're eating now. Eat." They're like you don't have an option. I'm like, Grandma, come on. <laughs> of course, but uh, but yeah, uh, it was quite a. It's quite good to be around family. So that that'll be cool if you could uh, make that work. But uh, yeah, I try to go visit my grandkids like every three months or so, and um. But I, I still work, uh, work for myself. But I still work. Some days, some weeks, I work a lot. Sometimes I don't work a lot, a lot at all. But I, if I do move to Atlanta, I'm actually going to hang up the delivering of furniture. My body's telling me to stop delivering furniture and just do i racing. <laughs> that sounds that sounds like a good plan. Retire yeah. to i racing. You know, I like that's yeah. a good idea. Um, yep. Yeah, so uh, those first 10 years of your life, what was like the what was the big things? Like, was there any like hobbies you had when you were a lot younger or like 
was there any big events that happened that you're like, hey, this was cool or a cool story? Well, like I don't remember that much when I was a kid, to be honest with you. I mean, I remember uh, I remember when I was when I was a kid, though, probably starting at like, I don't know, 10 years old or something. I used to, I wanted to make my own money, so I would cut lawns and take care of dogs and take care of people's houses and do whatever like a handyman would do today in on a kid level and saved money and bought my first car when I was 15 years old, which was a 1969 GTO Judge that I bought from a doctor that lived about maybe 10, 10 houses down the street. And he just had it parked in his driveway and I walked up to him and said, what are you doing with this thing? He says, nothing, I don't want it. And I said, you want to sell it? He goes, yeah, give me 800 bucks. So I said, okay, here's $800. And I took it. And I had that GTO for, I was probably, what, 1985. So I had it for many, many years, but I redid the whole thing. A lot of my friends back, back in that day, a lot of our friends at Chevelle's and Malibu's, uh, Camaro's and Firebird's and, we used to be a gang of us, maybe six, seven guys, and we would just go you know, terrorize the streets in our cars. Yeah, a Pontiac GTO, that is a sick car. That's a cool yeah. car. That's one that would be worth a lot of money today. Oh, my uh, believe me, but... I think about it. There's not a day that goes by <laughs> I don't think about it. I, Like I said, I bought it. It was clean, and I even made it cleaner and did some stuff to it. I didn't like brutally molested i just kept it kind of stock but um, the car was known in my high school for being a sleeper oh yeah yeah, yeah. makes sense yeah so uh so you you got that when you were 10 no i got that when i was 15 okay 15 i didn't even, yeah i didn't when did even you get have your a driver's, driver's license? license i didn't even have one i had a permit i had to wait for my dad to get home so he could so i could drive <laughs> you know, with an adult in the car. Yeah. My mom didn't want to do it. Um, so, yeah, and then when I got my license, then it was, you know, another thing. And then uh, got married when I was 18 mm-hmm. and still married to the same lady. So it's been Good. 44 years. Uh, just quick question still on the GTO. Um, were those four on the floor or three on the tree? Four on the floor. The four horse. on the floor. That's yeah. good. That's good. That's yeah, good. This, the Hurst, you, did you ever drive the, those those three on the trees? I did. My dad had a Dodge Caravan, um, like a, one of the, like, you know, like a van, but it was '69, I believe it was, and it had the three on the tree. That was pretty cool. <laughs> That'd be so interesting, yeah. you know, hitting the clutch. All right, next gear on the tree, you know, or hitting the clutch. All right, now we're up here. You know, <laughs> was I mean, it? That's, was, that's how I learned how to drive. Actually, not in the not in the Dodge, but in a in a Volkswagen. My dad had a I don't know, what was sixty two, I think VW, and that's how I learned how to drive in a sixty two VW. I'm not bad. So, was it a was it a Beetle? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if they called it a Beetle back then, but it looked the same as the Beetles of your age, let's say. But yeah. it was a sixty two. I remember I'm, that. I'm, I was thinking the sixties Beetles, like like uh, yeah, because now they call them Bugs. But yeah, um, yeah. Uh, so they're a girl car now. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. so you get married at eighteen. Yep. All right, and you're still living in California. Yep. And you go to any races while you're a kid, or? Oh yeah, we we live close to a place that's called Saga Speedway. They're no longer there. I mean the the, the track is still there, and they're using it as a swap meet. And the racetrack is still there, and the walls are still there with the red and white stripes, and it says Saga Speedway. But that's where I went. That's where I spent my childhood every Saturday night. Used to go there and watch. They had what they called were the modifieds, or sort of like the, uh, like this uh, super stocks right now, you know, like the Camaros and stuff. And then they did the figure eights, and yeah, every Saturday night I went there, went there with a couple of friends, and we watched the races. I remember my dad took us when we were young and went to a pizza place that still exists today. It's been there for over 50 years. And we used to go and have pizza there, the whole family. And then from there, we used to go to the racetrack. And, and then as I got older, then I went to the racetrack by myself with my friends. And 
Mm-hmm. Uh, been to Riverside. I don't know if you know <gasps> where. Dude, I don't know if you know about Riverside Road Course. I so I'm a huge fan of um, I'm a huge and EMSA fan. So like Riverside being replaced by a Costco sucks because I don't know if you know <laughs> there's now a Costco where Riverside is. That is wow. so painful for me. I love Riverside because that was one of the first NASCAR races. You'd have always the uh, L.A. Times. Um, what was it? The L.A. Times six hour race that went on there, right? Or was yeah, it two I never hours? went for the only ones I went for were the Cup cars and then uh-huh. the Southwest Tour that they used to run over there too. Um, and then they used to have some special events. I used to go there once in a while, but I've been to Riverside uh, Auto Club Speedway. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Irwindale Raceway, uh, Orange Show Speedway out in San Bernardino, El Cajon Speedway, like all these places are no longer there. Yeah, obviously. Well, auto and, and Auto Club. I mean, Auto's I don't know. Not there really, but <laughs> yeah, Auto Club says they're coming back as a short track, but like I don't believe that. I don't I believe think, it either. I, I went yeah, to the last race, so I know. <laughs> I didn't believe it. Yeah, I didn't believe it from the beginning. When they decided to do it, at, I mean, the land out here in California is just worth way too much money. It's just like, you know, I mean, this is California. It's just way, we're just worth way too much money. I actually went to the first race, too. Uh, I think the first race at California Speed was won by Jimmy Johnson, right? Jeff Gordon. Jeff Gordon, Jeff Gordon ran, okay. won that first one uh, in 97 or 98. The second one was won by my favorite driver, Mark Martin. And actually, not in that one. Oh, where is that one at? I have that die cast of the one he won at Fontana in. It wasn't the Thunderbird. It was the um, the Taurus. Taurus? The Taurus. Yeah, yeah, he had one on a streak in the Taurus uh, that year in 98. So. Yeah, I went about 98. Was that when the track opened up? Um... I don't think so. I think it was earlier than that. It was 97. So so Jeff Gordon won the first race. Mark Martin was in contention for it, but lost when did, it. What year did Jimmy Johnson win it? Jimmy Johnson wasn't in the Cup Series until 03 or 04. But that was his first win. So probably 03. Um, I call it Fontana. Yeah. My dad is kind of a California native-ish, and so okay. I kind of get all that, you know, stuff from him. I just remember, I just remember going to a race at at Auto Club, and Jimmy Johnson was in. He won the race actually, and I had a friend of mine, actually a guy that worked for me, went to Las Vegas, and he was a at a I don't know Caesars or whatever. I told him he went to the sports book, and I said put twenty bucks on Jimmy Johnson, and Jimmy Johnson won, and I got three hundred bucks out of it. <laughs> yeah, so this proves how good my memory is. You know what I said? Jeff Gordon won the first race in uh, 97. Mark Martin wins number two, and then Jeff Gordon came back to win in 99. I knew that. Um, Jimmy Johnson okay. wins his first Cup Series race in 2002. Uh, so 2002 okay. for Jimmy Jam. So that would have been 2002 then if that happened. Yeah, that, that's not, in that, in that, yeah, Napa Auto Parts 500. It was a map of Auto Parts 500 back then, eh? I, don't know I think so, yeah. yeah. I don't remember what and all it was the sponsors auto, It was the Auto Club 500, and then Sony, and back to Auto Club. Kind of interesting. Yeah. So I'll tell you something cool. You wanna, if you want to hear something cool, my son worked for NASCAR for a while. Okay, yeah. So he went to, he went to college. He went to Arizona, um, University of Arizona, and they... I don't know if they, they must have did some kind of interview or something. So, because he knows everything about sports, like he knows who won, where, when, why, and how, and he, he knows all that stuff. And he knew a lot about racing because I, when he got old enough, I took him to the racetrack and we still today, he watches the races and we talk about it. But anyway, what I was going to say is, is that when NASCAR decided to do the hall of fame in Charlotte, you know that the Hall of Fame out yeah, there? Yeah, the Hall of Fame, yeah. So my son was a part of it. He went there uh, on their dime to help them uh, with the stats of all the wins and, and the drivers and all that stuff. I've got a newspaper article up here on my wall. I don't know. I can, see, I can show you real quick if you can see it. Mm-hmm. 
anyway, that's a newspaper article that that they sent um, because he did an internship for them for a while. And in that internship, he called me one day and said, Dad, I'm going to have an, I'm going to get an award. So I've got three passes for the Daytona 500. Do you want to go? I said, heck yeah, I'll go. So I jumped on a plane and we went and we got gratis the trucks, Xfinity, and Bush back then, and the Cup Series. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and we were in the pit area, on pit road, we were in the garages, we went to the prayer meeting, we went to the driver's meeting, we did the whole ball of wax, went to all the haulers, and had the free food and the drinks and all the stuff that they do over there. We had what they called back back in the day, they called it a black card. The black card basically got you anywhere you wanted to go. And we went to uh, NASCAR's headquarters in Daytona as well, and I met Jack Roush, and I saw Benny Parsons and Buddy Baker and a lot of the old guys. Didn't care much for Jack Roush because he was kind of snobbish. But, <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. But, yeah, it was a, that was a really cool time, and he wanted to go work for NASCAR, but they just didn't have, I guess they didn't have spots open or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that would. Well, yeah, that that sounds pretty cool. Uh, Christopher going down there did that. Maybe working for NASCAR, but uh, uh, so in your team you went to that little dirt track. Is there any other racing you did as a kid? Like any other racing race tracks you went to as a kid, or just that one track that's got the flea market at it? Well, like I said, Saugus P. It was, it was actually a it's a third mile flat mm-hmm. racetrack paved. But like I said, besides that one, we went. I went to Orange Show Speedway, El Cajon Speedway. Mesa Marin, have you heard of Mesa Marin in Bakersfield? No, um, I've not heard of that one. There's a there's a there's a racetrack now in Bakersfield called Curtin County Raceway. That's Kevin oh, yeah, Harvick's yeah. now. Kevin Harvick's right, so, Curtin County. So Kevin Harvick used to race at Mesa Marin, and I used to go to Mesa Marin and watch him race. They hated him out there. That the people in the stands hated him because he was. They felt like he was cheating, like uh, like the Silver Spoon. His dad had uh-huh. a lot of money. And so he had all the top-notch stuff, and so he won all the time. And a lot of the fans didn't like him. But anyway, Mace Marin closed down to development, too. And then the owners of Mace Marin, which is Colin, uh, what's his name, something Colin, I think, uh, he teamed up with somebody else, and he opened up Kern Raceway, which is not too far from the original Mace Marin. Um, and then you know, Kevin Harvick to- took over the racetrack, I don't know, probably a year or two ago. Yeah, yeah. So went oh. there, went there many times. I got a really cool story. My dad took us once. We were going to go to Mesa Marin. It was this. It was advertised this track. They spent over a million dollars to put it up, half mile high banked, blah blah. blah. So I said, okay, we're going to go out there. So we drive out to Bakersfield. We get to this racetrack and pay to get in. And here's this racetrack. It's a quarter mile dirt racetrack, and the people that were there were like obviously locals and that's all that they did and we sit down in the stands and it was like a million dollars for this place here i can't believe it well a guy sitting next to us heard us talking he goes oh no you're you're at the wrong racetrack you're at bakersfield speedway you want to go to another place called mesa marin and then he gave us the directions to that one so we left bakersfield speedway and headed out to mesa marin so that was a really that was a really fun time yeah so We've talked about how the racetracks that you went to as a kid is slowly shut down, you know, Riverside. Yep. And you can even see it today, even with Laguna Seca being threatened by the houses. And, uh, well, even out here, you know, um, any all the racetracks in Utah are threatened. You know, uh, uh, Rocky Mountain Raceway just closed down. Um, UMC is headed that direction with what it's going on with that. But uh, what's kind of, what do you think was the big driving force to shutting down these racetracks? Is it that people just aren't, interested in racing anymore is it just the money in the land what what is yeah the land at least here in california the land's just way too valuable i mean if they asked the people the people would have the racetracks here Mm -hmm. but the but the track the the land just demands way too much money and so they just you know they just sell out do it i mean i know like where kern raceway is is actually kind of out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it's right on 
Highway 99, which is a major highway, but there's actually nothing around there. Yeah. So, I mean, and they're building more and more around there, so I would imagine, you know, 20, 30 years down the road, that that land will probably be worth too much, too, and then they'll probably tear that racetrack down. But in the meantime, it's there. But, yeah, it's definitely the land. It's just just worth so much money that they can put shopping malls or they could put houses and, yeah, real estate real big out here in California and it goes up in value real estate just keeps climbing whereas in a lot of other states you know we have the saying here that people in California buy a house as an investment and people in other states they buy a house to live <laughs> it all makes sense yeah it does yeah especially with that big sale of the speedway but um so you get married at 18 you're moving furniture um, what what you just 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 living in California doing your thing? Sounds like you had a pretty simple life. You just did your thing. Yeah, that's probably yeah, it's pretty simple, I guess. I mean, we live we live out in the suburb. We live on two and a half acres. Mm. Got my house in the front and my shop in the back with my truck in the yeah. back and my my office in the back and got a few toys around here and nice and peaceful and serene, but. Uh, miss family, so it's. I think it's time to move on. That makes sense, you know. Move to Atlanta. Housing prices can't be too bad in Atlanta. I uh, know. Fortunately, that's where that's where being in California pays off for us because, the, well, you know, the land, the property that we have is worth a lot of money. So we could sell this and buy something really nice cash out there. So that that's nice for retirement. Whereas, you know, if somebody wants to come from there to over here. It's another story. Yeah, you're screwed. Um, so, so, so you had two kids. Um, your first kid was a boy, Christopher. Um, yep. Well, you had to be what, 24? You had your first kid. Uh, eighty uh, sixty-two, and he was born in eighty-eight. So that's what twenty-six. Twenty-six. Yeah. How, how was uh, yeah. was was that scary having a kid for the first time, or were you ready for that? You know, we got married, well, see, I got married when I was 18. My wife's 20, was 21, and we did what we wanted to do for those eight years or whatever mm -hmm. first, right? And I knew I always wanted kids, and my wife was kind of on the fence, and, and then we kind of just talked about it one day. So you know, I could have them forever, but you can't have them forever. So we need to decide if we're going to have kids or we're not going to have kids. And we just decided to do it. But by that time, we had already established ourselves, bought a house, bought a second house, had decent jobs, uh, had cars. I mean, you know, we were all set. So it was it was time to spread the name, right? So, which yeah. we, so we just decided to do it and had the boy right away, pretty much, and then waited a little bit, decided to have a another one, had the girl, and that was it. Boy and a girl, that's all we wanted. If I had my choice now, I'd probably had more kids, but back then I only <laughs> wanted two. It's all right. You can adopt me. You can deal with my shenanigans. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want me. Um, but, uh, man, uh, that's amazing. So, Christopher, the youngest, in the year uh, 2036, then you had a girl two years later, Emily. Um, yep. Yeah, you didn't get married for eight years. That's true. What did you do in those eight years? you guys just party or – what did you guys go? Did you guys go explore the world? What happened? Yeah, we, yeah we, I mean, we went on vacations. We had – you know, we went to on a few vacations, and we bought, like I said, we bought a we bought a house, and then we bought a second house, and um, just kind of lived the life, a married life of two people. You know, we did what we wanted to do, and then we just decided it was time to have kids. So, um, a lot of people do it the other way around. You know, they find out they're going to have a kid, then they get married, and then it's like you lose all that reason that you got married. I mean, like. Yeah. You know, when you when you meet somebody, you want to spend time with that person, and if you decide to have kids right away, you know it kind of disturbs the peace, so to speak. It would. That makes so, sense. Yeah, that's yeah. smart. Um, so Christopher, you know, so how was how was raising a boy and a girl uh, in California? What was what was the interesting moments in that? Because it's obviously challenging to raise kids. You know, I got a lot of respect for my dad and my parents. You know, but. Uh, what was the interesting moments in that? I mean, 
Like I said, I think we're pretty fortunate, and I you know, guess we raised them, so I maybe maybe we can take some credit for that. But both of them are extremely wonderful kids. And my son is very successful. My daughter's successful too. My son was a big athlete. I mean, he still holds basketball records from high school today that haven't been broken. Um, my daughter was big into soccer. Uh, had their challenges with friends and stuff like that, but you know. Teenage years are always like that. It's it's always going to be something, but now for the most part, we've had a it's it's real good upbringing. I mean, can't really can't really complain about. It. At least I don't remember. You know, I remember I remember the good. I don't remember the bad. I don't focus on that. It's not that that tears you down, right? You have to focus yeah. on the good. So yeah, it was good. And now I see uh, now I see him with his kids and. I see that he's following a lot of the footsteps that I was taking, and that's kind of cool to see um, that it, it's got something instilled in his mind and how he was raised, and so he's trying to do the same. And then my daughter, she's not married, but she's um, she's an awesome person. I mean, it's going to be really tough. She lives here in Long Beach in Southern California as well. Mm-hmm. That's going to be really tough if I have to pick up and leave from here, but I'll just have to make time to come out and visit or send her to come over and visit and stuff because we're really close. But she's like the only family that we have here in California. Everybody else is gone. So, um, yeah. yeah. So we interviewed it's, it's been- Pardon me. I apologize. We interviewed Jason Day last night, uh, and yeah. one of the big things for him – was he got to kind of live out the things he didn't get to do as a kid through his kids in baseball. Was there anything that you got to live out that you didn't get to do as a kid through your kids? I mean, I was, I'm an asthmatic, so I could never play sports in school, but I'm a big guy, and so I got hounded by the football coach always wanted me to play football, but I, I just couldn't do it. The best, the only sport I could do, really, and I was kind of number one at it, was the 50-yard dash. Mm-hmm. Um, but once I did the 50 yard dash, I was, I was done. That was all I could handle. That's all my body could handle, uh, because of my asthma. So I don't know that I really lived through the kids a whole lot. Um, I mean, maybe a little bit in, in football. You know, I really enjoyed watching my son play football and basketball. Although I don't, I didn't really have that big of aspirations to play that when I was in high school. So, uh, no, not really. Not really. I mean, I wish I had a little bit more drive like my son has. Um, he's got a little bit more drive in, in being successful, so to speak. I mean, he's he's become really successful. He's a big AT&T executive now, so he could basically take me wherever I wanted to go now. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm really, I'm really proud of both of them because, they're, like I said, they're both on their own, self-sufficient, and they still call dad once in a while to find out when certain things happen in life, you know, <laughs> we've got, I've got the experience that they don't have, and for the most part, they do listen, and they do, they do heed my advice, but there's sometimes they don't, and they just, they have to learn their lesson, I guess. You forget that phone call? I remember I called my dad at like 11 o'clock at night, like two months ago. I moved out of my parents' house eight months ago, so I'm pretty young still, but, uh, I remember it was like probably three or four months ago. I, I, so my fridge was like making sizzling noises. And so I'm going to call my dad. I'm like, uh, dad, my fridge is making sizzling noises. He goes, what? I'm like, when I push it, it sizzles. He's like, dude, it's just a condensation. Go to bed. Like he's, I call my parents for the weirdest things. I'm like, uh, so can you like freeze lunch me? And like the weirdest conversations, you know, you just calm. You're like, you just have the weirdest questions you could think of. Can I freeze this or do that? You cannot freeze sliced cheese. Chi- sliced cheese. I had to learn that one the hard way. It just crumbles. It just crumbles. It doesn't survive. The funny thing, the funny thing, like with my son, is like he'll. Everybody texts these days. That's how you mm-hmm. communicate, right? Everybody texts, and I and and we get texts like pretty much every day about something, hello, or NASCAR, or my daughter will text me or something like that. But if, if the phone rings and my son is calling me, I know that it's not to say hello. 
it's because there's a problem. Like the car's got a problem, or he's got a problem with his wife, or he's got a problem with his kid, or he needs some advice on this or that. I know it's not just a courtesy call to say, hey, Dad, how you doing? <laughs> that, my dad's... <laughs> but that's the way it is. That was the same way, you know. My dad's the same way, you know. I, I, I pulled up to my house oh, it was a Sunday night, and I look up at, the, at my old house. I pulled up to my parents' house, and I look up, and I can see my dad up in his office on his phone. And I turn over to the guy I was with, and I said, "My dad's helping one of my one of one of his children. I don't know which one, but one of them." I walk in the house, and I I look at him and I say, "Which one?" He goes, "Luke." I'm like, "Call it." <laughs> he's helping one of his kids always. He's on the phone. He's helping one of his kids. That's just how that works. He's he's telling him, "Oh, this or that," you know, like, "Oh, my power went out. Oh, I need to fix this. Whatever," you know. He's he's the man. You just call him and say, "Hey, I'm having this problem." Oh, do this, this, and this. Oh, sweet, fixed. We're done. You know. So uh, I'm sure you had a lot of those phone calls, didn't you? Oh, uh, yeah. One recent one was my his. I see my son's wife and and the kids. They were visiting her family in Knoxville, Tennessee, and he was home alone. And he came outside to the trash can and he says, "Dad." I'm out here in the trash can, and, I, and there's this pipe coming out right by the wall of the house. It's got a meter on it, and it's hissing, and it smells. I said, dude, call 911 right now because that's <laughs> gas. And so I, and I, but I said, but there should be a shutoff valve on it. So I kind of tried to walk him through the shutoff valve, but he couldn't get it shut off. So I said, okay, well, you need to call 911. It was a Sunday. I said, you need to call 911 and they'll have the fire department come out and shut down the gas system on your house because the gas is leaking and that's extremely dangerous. dangerous so he yeah. did. Um, but yeah, I get those kind of calls from once in a while. And my daughter, too, she has a problem with the car. And she actually, actually, she actually called me yesterday because she had her alternator replaced back in June. And now it's giving her problems again. So she texted me yesterday and asked about it. I said, well, for the most part, you should have a 90-day warranty. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. You have to check with the people that fixed it. But, yeah, I yeah. get those kind of phone calls. Yeah. Uh, I talked to my dad, and it, he's like, I enjoy those phone calls. Is that true? That you what? He enjoys those phone calls. He enjoys getting that phone call going, hey, I need help. And he's like... Uh, and he just, he's just happy to be there to help. Well, yeah, I mean, I enjoy any time I get to talk with the kids uh -huh. because they have, you know, everybody's busy in their lives, especially, like, I don't know, I can't really say a whole lot for other states, but, like, my son's he's in a high-caliber job, and my daughter lives out here in California, so she's always on the go and on the run and all that stuff. So when you can actually talk to them, for me as a father, yeah, it's really, it's special because I still, you know, I, I feel, well, they appreciate the fact that they can call me and they can get information from me. And that's, yeah, I do. I do like that. That's why I really kind of want to be closer because I've got grandkids now too. Mm -hmm. And and I'm missing out on all the years with them. And, and not only that, but my dad's still alive and kicking very well, driving, <laughs> going. He goes to the races with us and everything. He's 92 years old. And he's doing everything that I would do. So he lives over there as well. And I, I mean, I'm no fool. I know that, you know, the days are numbered. So, I mean, being 92, I mean, I don't think most people don't live that long. So yeah. I know that that time's coming and I want to be able to spend some time with him before that time comes. So. That makes sense. And like what you're saying about the grandkids, you know, I have, I have seven nieces and nephews, you know, that is it's such a blessing to uh, – <laughs> it's hilarious. On Monday, I get a phone call at 10 o'clock. You know, I'm at work. I literally am driving in my truck at work. I get a phone call. It's Presley. She's nine. Uh, and she's like, Bryant, we're going to Lagoon, the amusement park here in Utah. You're coming with us. I'm like, I'm at work. She's like, all right, this is what we're going to do. You're going to hop on the train, and you're going to come to Lagoon. And I said – all right, I'll get all my dumpsters done. I'm going to Lagoon. Go through, and I'm just pounding through that 18 speed like none other, just trying to get through my day. Ended up there at 6 o'clock. We're at Lagoon, you know, ride two rides. Then I go home. 
you know, just for that little girl, I'd do anything for my nieces and nephews. Like I did a, a two hour train ride, you know, to just ride two rides, then go home. <laughs> it, it's, yep. you do anything for them. And I know it, it's a little different I, to grandchildren yeah. and nieces and nephews, but dude, it, it's so important. My daughter and I, we go to out here in Orange County. They have what they call the Orange County Fair. We've had fairs all over the place, but you know where they have vendors are set up with food and they have rides and all that stuff. And and we go there. We've been going there for 13 years now, and it's always right. I think the fair closes now the 19th, but we go out every year. We go to the fair, and she always takes pictures of us having a beer and turkey legs, and 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 she comes up about once a month and we go to this restaurant that's close by called schooners and she takes pictures of us having a beer and all that. And then all that stuff pops up on Facebook as memories and all that stuff. (laughs) That's really cool. That's nice. That's nice. Let's talk a little bit more about California and stuff. Well, you can, well, actually let's let's stay on the grandkids. I was told not to circle too much. Um, So how many grandkids do you have? Two. Two boy, girl, how old boy, girl. And how old? Uh, my, let's see, my granddaughter is nine. Oh, that's a good Yeah, and, uh, Jackson is six. Yeah, That one's a little tougher. I took a five-year-old to Vegas in March. Whew. Mm. That was challenging. That was challenging. (laughs) Yeah, Vegas at, Vegas at one time, they tried to become kid-friendly, but that never materialized anything. Vegas is not kid friendly no it is not we took, kid friendly we took them to circus circus so it, it actually went pretty good if you know what circus circus is uh yeah it, w- it went pretty good we took them down to the midway at a good time but five and five six is definitely a tough age of trying to learn their you know they talk a lot they got a lot of interest it's it's interesting yeah we used to go to we used to go to vegas when i was a kid too we used to go to a racetrack out there called craig road speedway Mm-hmm. I don't know if you ever heard of Craig Road Speedway, but it's um, the one that's on the um, yeah, it's on the south it's side. On the out, it's on the outskirts, yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, well, there's two of them. There's there's another race, another short track now that the the Bushes grew up on. Kurt Bush and Kyle Bush and the dad they used to race at uh, at a racetrack out there, and not Craig Road though. Craig Road, uh, Craig Road's not. I don't think Craig Road's there anymore, but. We used to go to the to Las Vegas and go to Craig Road Speedway. Yeah, that was a lot of fun those days. There's, there's another road course that's south. I was thinking, so I was thinking of. And then you also got LL, obviously uh, Las Vegas Motor Speedway. We took the kid there, and you know. Yeah, we've good. been there once too. I took my wife's not big into racing, but she decided to go with me one year. We went to Las Vegas. This is a few years back, and there was a massive windstorm and rain, and I mean it was just miserable for her she could yeah. like it was terrible we parked the car i purposely parked the car under a sign that had it was a dale earnhardt sign and she just couldn't handle it up in stands anymore and so she said well i'm going to go down and sit in the car and she walked out of the car all the signs everything blew down so she couldn't find a car just <laughs> walked around and walked around and walked around and she couldn't find a car <laughs> that's horrible oh my yeah. gosh las vegas was i liked las like, like we, we had that kind of same problem when we were in las vegas the wind was just insane it was to the point where like we uh we were watching the news and it was knocking down power lines and all kinds of oh, stuff yeah and we were out in that wind of course where's our seats we're at the very very top all right right where the wind goes right over we're just getting wind burnt to heck we had a ball though we enjoyed it um the Xfinity race was definitely the hardest. Trucks was kind of cold, but yeah, man. Talk about like races. You've been to Fontana a few times, right? Yep. yep. Yeah. Several times. Ever snowed yeah. while you've been at Fontana? Have I? I'm sorry. Has it snowed while you've been on? I've been at Font. Been in Font. In the mountains. So but that's very. That's very typical here for California. You can, you can go skiing and then drive an hour or two hours and go to the beach. So I'm from That's Utah. California. I'm from Utah. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. We went down there in uh, late February 2023, the last race ever, right, at, at Fontana. Right. 
And of course, we come from Utah. It's colder in Fontana than it is in Utah. We brought the cold with us. We actually hit the storm twice because we flew into Utah. We hit it twice. But Fontana was really interesting. Um, I always wanted to go to that racetrack. So what, what significance did Fontana mean to you? Like, was it, was it important to you or was it just a race to go watch? No, I really, I really enjoyed going to the racetrack. Um, and I was actually, I was actually really excited when they were talking about putting a short track out there, but I mean, just the way they talked about it, the way they talked about how they were going to sell off some of the land. And just because I live out here, I know what that area looks like. And yeah, I kind of just said, I just kind of said from the very beginning, yeah. it's not going to happen. And, and if you think about it, it's been so, you don't hear anything about it. You hear nothing. No. There's no developments or anything like that. And I think what they're doing is they're keeping it completely hush because they're going and they're going to hope that people just forget about it. Exactly. And they're going to they're going to wait four or five years and then they're just going to sell the rest of the land and get even more money from the rest of that land because the price is going to go through the roof now. And, well, because uh, they, they sold half. They, I mean, it's a huge, it's a huge property. Yeah, um, it used to be an old Kaiser mill that used to a steel plant that mm-hmm. had the whole that whole area, and then um, Penske bought the whole land, and then they built the racetrack and all that. But they sold off half the land. Um, but I know what's going to happen. They're just they're going to sell the other. You can't you can't really you know, new people don't want to have a racetrack next to their home. I mean, it's like it's us old people that we. We want that old racetrack, that nostalgia and all that. And yeah. the new people coming in, they're not that much into it, I don't think. That's why it's been so difficult for NASCAR to get new people in to watch it. That's why they try so hard to get new fans. Um, the problem with the new fans is that everybody wants their information like right away, and they only want they only want results. People don't want, you know, it's on your phone. You know, everything is on your phone. You can get, you can get stats and information like right away. It's us older, but you're in that generation. You know, I, I can even tell with my son too, but a lot of the fan, they don't, they don't have the patience that we have as older people to sit through a whole race or pay attention to the whole thing, you know? So very few people that do. Yeah, no, there's definitely, when I get a chance, it's been a tough as of late for me to sit down and watch a whole race. I sat down and I watched pretty much the whole of Richmond this last weekend. If I get a chance to, I'm going to sit down and watch that whole race. And my dad's a floater. He'll float in. And, but what's kind of funny is he'll float in and out until about the last 30 or 40 laps. Then he'll sit down and we'll watch the last 40 laps of the race, you know. Um, but I typically I, watch the I typically watch the whole race like, oh, if we're home and we're not doing anything or my wife doesn't want to go somewhere or something like that, and I'll, I'll watch the race. I like to watch it from start to finish because, for me, there's a lot that goes into it. A lot of I, – I pay attention to when people pit. I pay attention to if they take yeah. two tires, four tires, you know, where they're exactly. at on fuel and stuff. And all that – for me, that's the entertainment. It's not just the side-by-side racing. It's uh, – that's one of the reasons that I really – I like I'm in several leagues, and one of the major reasons that I enjoy the chop shop is because the races are set up so that there can be a strategy play. Exactly, and that you know fuel tires. Um, I love the no fast repairs. To me, that's just that's just the way to go. I think it changes the mentality of it, and. Uh, there's, I've been, like I said, I've been in several leagues. I probably have to say Chop Shop and uh, VRL are probably the two. They probably go hand in hand for me. One runs on Tuesday, one runs on Wednesday. That's why I was telling you that I was I had to do it in 15 minutes because I was running a, I was running a race at Richmond with the VRL league, but I'd gotten crashed out, so I was getting the truck repaired, but I didn't get it fixed in time. So anyway, but yeah, nonetheless, yeah. but yeah, I really appreciate. It. I really appreciate the racing at Chop Shop. I have a lot of fun, and um, it's always some stuff. Sometimes there's some things that go wrong, but uh, there's just another day. (laughs) 
The chop Shop is awesome. They do such a good job with the officiating. Uh, it's just, it, it can get hard to race sometimes. Do you ever get burnt out? Um, I mean, I, like, I get, I get kind of burnt out on the hosted lobbies. You know, if you, if it's not a league race, I get kind of burnt out on those. Um, but like I said, I join, I've joined several leagues and tried to run them to see which ones I like. I mean, like I, you don't know when you join a league, whether you're going to like it or not. And so I've joined so many and I've actually, I probably, I probably belong to like 15 different leagues. Mm. And I think I've narrowed it down to like three that I enjoy running. And that's like, that's, that's like a Tuesday, Wednesday, and a Tuesday, Wednesday, and the other leagues on a Friday to Saturday. Um, I don't get burned out on the league races, to be honest with you, because they're more organized. I don't, I don't stay with a league that's not somewhat disciplined, you know, that's right. why I like Chop Chop because they are somewhat disciplined. There's, there's some stuff that goes on which I don't really like too much. I mean, something yesterday at Kansas wasn't too thrilled about an event there, but you get you talk about that. We talk about that some stuff that went down with Jerry Culver, I believe. Was it Jerry uh, or was it, it was it Jerry? Yeah, it was Jerry. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah they, they said I mean, that we could talk about that if you want. I, it's not going to strike me. He's like, you need to talk about this. Talk about his well, opinion on that that situation. Uh, so so for me. So, I started, uh, I don't know where I started, like 20th or 18th or something like that. And I worked myself up to the top 10, and I put myself on the wall all by myself. It was nobody's fault but my own. I was behind, I think, uh, Connor Hazel, I think was his name. You were. And, yeah. and I think I got, and when I went to the turn, it wouldn't turn. I think, the, I think I was just too close to him, so the air got taken off the nose. And I, and I ran into the wall, and I lost probably eight spots from that, you know, just trying to get off the wall. Fortunately, the truck was okay, but that was probably 20 laps before or something like that. So I was playing catch-up the whole time. And then at the end there, yeah, Jerry, at the end, I don't know what he was, I don't know what he was doing, but, I mean, came from, like, the bottom and just wiped out the whole freaking field. Yeah. And for me... For me, I went from like sixteenth to eighth. Like I made it through the melee. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm one of the ones. I actually commented on the on the chat mm-hmm. that he owes a lot. He owes some. He owes a lot. People a lot of apologies, and he apologized to me. I go, don't apologize to me. Like I benefited from what you did, but right. man, you just you destroyed a lot of because there's for me. Like I get on the eye racing. I'm. I get on there for a reason. I get on there because I want to accomplish something. I don't want to go in there and get wrecked. And so yeah. when you work the whole race and you feel like you've accomplished something and then somebody comes and takes it away, does a move like that. Yeah. I mean, ugh. yeah, it's a game. I understand it's a game, but still, some people take it serious. Some people don't take it too serious. But, like, if you're having a bad race and you don't care, right? But if you're having a good race and something like that happens, so I don't have no ill feelings towards them. I mean, it is what it is. I mean, I don't remember stuff like that. I don't, I don't, I don't take it to the next race or anything. But to be honest, it's in the back of my mind. Like it's like I go into a corner and I see it's going to be Jerry. I'm like, oh, I better crap. back off it. You know? <laughs> oh crap! I, know. <laughs> I mean, there's a few guys. There's a few guys in that league, and not only that league, but the other leagues I run too. Like. I race with them all the time, so I know I know how I how I can race around them if I want to race the whole race, you know. And so I give, I do a lot of giving, mm-hmm. not a lot of taking. I do a lot of giving, um, but I my intention is to start the race and finish the race. Exactly. I don't want to get wrecked out, you know, and I don't want to wreck somebody else's race out. I feel like I feel like I give a lot of respect on the racetrack. I know if somebody's faster. I let them go. I don't really fight them too much, you know. That's just who I. That's why. That's probably why I consider myself a mid packer. Yeah, yeah. I, I I was actually talking to Anthony Shook. Um, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. We were we were texting, and I he's like, we were gonna do an interview tomorrow, right? T- yesterday, but we got Jason Day instead. Um, yeah. All I get this morning at six a.m. my time. 
my bad. I was so pissed after the race. I just got off. I said, it's okay. We got Jason Day. He said, yeah, I completely got driven through and was like, what, and was like, um, it, it, he's like, he's like, get, I'm out everything down, went to bed, shut everything down. He put the S word, everything down. Um, <laughs> Uh, he was so angry, and he's like Jerry well, Culver. <laughs> yeah, Jerry you know I mean, it is. Culver. And I try to like I try to explain that into into another league that I'm in. It's like you know the guys need you need to not just think about yourself. You know you have to think about other people too. Because like I said, some people just get in there and they just race, and whatever happens happens. But not everybody feels that way. You know. Like, I, I get really just, like, I got wrecked out today at Richmond by uh-huh. somebody that just basically did an Austin Dillon move on me. Uh-huh. And, you know, like like Austin Dillon did to uh, Denny Gano. Hamlin, although, although I, I mean, it looked the same way, although I don't think that Austin's was that malicious, but that's, that's another story. But, you know, <laughs> I had 31 minutes worth of damage, so I pretty much was done, you know. Yeah. But it's like there's no need for that kind of stuff, and I don't put myself – in those kind of positions either to jeopardize somebody's race. I just try to do that. So I just try to be as respectful as I can. I understand that. Um, I've been sponsored to do some races in the Icon Cup Series recently by uh, Pit Stop TV. And um, it's been frustrating. So I did Chicago Street Course. That's one of my specialty tracks. Um, I love that track. It's so good. Um, yeah. And do you ever watch a D-Car? Have I what? Do you ever watch IndyCar? IndyCar? Uh, I, watch, I usually watch the Indy, Indianapolis 500. That's it. That's it. Well, a couple of years ago, you saw Paddle Award dive bomb Scott Dixon at Long Beach. And so uh, it was kind of like a Scott Dixon Paddle Award kind of move. I already turned into the corner, and this guy just decides, screw it. I'm just going to go right through. It hits my rear and spins me out. No apology, dude. I was so angry. I'm trying to race for the sponsor. You know, I'm headed for a top three. All right. And he just dumps me um, because he doesn't know how to drive. And then I get to auto club and I get this guy. He like, I got to the front. I got really good stage points for this, uh, broad, this sponsor. And he said, I want you to come back for auto club, I come back for auto club. And I'm racing. I'm in the back all day. This is a 40 car field. I'm in the back all day long, just struggling, fighting, and I make it up to the. T- I slowly break up from the 30s to the 20s. I'm in the teens, getting towards the end of the race. I'm racing for a top 10. I'm pushing. We're coming up. We're going through auto. We're we're, we're coming up off the corner of the Auto Club, and this guy. I'm, we're going through turns three and four, and he just keeps tapping the render of my car. Just just keeps tapping it, tapping it, and I'm slowly getting loose. So I can't fool up the racetrack, right? Because I got to correct the car and try to keep it there. And finally, we yeah. come off the corner, and he just he, – you can watch his car. His car does – there's a whole, like, shake and just turns me out. It's – we're, like, two laps to go. The guy who is going to go in the race is already celebrating. Nope. Two or three green, light, white checker flags later, you know. Uh, it was two green white checker, green white checkers, and man, I come home seventh, which was better because everybody wrecked in front of me. But I went all the way to the back, had a fight. It's just so frustrating uh, to race for a sponsor, and you're racing for a ride. If I don't do well, I. <laughs> but also, I'm a visitor. I'm not a, a normal racer. You know, I don't race every week, so I got to be really cautious. I don't race with you guys every week. I'm, I'm not. Right. They don't know me. You got to race nice. You know, and it can get frustrating when you're just trying to just not make any contact and people just hook you. You know, there's yeah. nothing you can do. Um, how long? How long have you been on iRacing? racing? Um, I've been sim racing for three and a half years. I've been on iRacing racing for a year and a half. All right, so I got on the iRacing racing bef- uh, just before uh, the whole COVID nineteen thing came. Okay, yeah. yeah. And um, I've noticed because after you know during COVID nineteen, so I racing became big, right? Yeah. And all this uh, money that the government was giving to people, um, I noticed right after that there was a 
boatload of console players that came over to iRacing mm-hmm. and changed the whole atmosphere of iRacing. Like if you've ever if you've played console racing like NASCAR Heat or whatever, right? That's that's where I that's where I started on, on Xbox with NASCAR Heat Two, I think. Okay, yeah. Uh, the mentality over there is so much different than it than it is in iRacing, but not any longer. The mentality from NAS, from the console players has come over to iRacing, which yeah, is has. very evident in the hosted rooms. Extremely, extremely evident. Extremely. Yeah. And that's why that's kind of deterred me from the hosted rooms because I don't I don't enjoy that. I don't enjoy the I don't I don't enjoy the influx of people that go in there and that, that just don't care. And yeah. so that's why I try to hook up with certain leagues. But that's what I enjoy doing. Yeah, I know. So I get what you're saying about the console. Uh, the console is definitely more toxic. Um, I'm oh, Bri- I'm, absolutely. I'm Bryant Lucas. My gamer tag is Btrend One All. I was the owner of Lightyear Racing. Um, we had 13 series, over 250 drivers, uh, multiple night. Uh, well, we'd have like three races on Saturday nights. Oh, Saturday. Actually, we had four on Saturday. Two races on Sunday. We had a race every night of the week. Um, 21 person admin staff. Matt, we were the biggest league on console. All right. And which uh, on which one? Box or the PlayStation? On or the what? box. On the box, the box. On Xbox. We had we had stuff on Wreckfest, mostly NASCAR. We had eight series of NASCAR Heat Five, Wreckfest, mm-hmm. um, Forza. Oh gosh, what's the uh, Project Cars Two uh, for our IndyCar league? We had tons and tons of league leagues and yeah we i uh, ran a league with i ran a league with another uh, another guy mike everidge um we ran three wide racing over okay, there yeah. on nascar heat yeah um we ran that for a few years and then we decided to bring it over here to i racing actually mike came over to i racing before me and then i came over and we started three wide over here but after about a season, I don't know, season, two seasons, whatever it was, I just I just told Mike, and Mike was think, thinking the same thing. He just didn't say anything to me. We were both thinking the same thing. We just, we, we came over, we want to have fun. We want to race. I don't want to deal with all the, I don't want to deal with all this fighting and everybody yeah. complaining and, and, you know, having to reprimand people and stuff. I want to race. So we just decided we're not going to run the league anymore. And then we just decided to you know, join some leagues and race that way. Much better. I, yeah, I can turn I, my computer on. I go do my thing. I can turn my computer off. <laughs> exactly. I love that. And that was one of the yeah. biggest things I, I got to that point and we were so massive. And I finally, I just got burned out. I had to just let it, let it die. I let it die. Uh, it was yeah. just too much. It was, we were massive. Um, we were making money too. at it. Like it was insane. Wow. Um, and we just let it. I just was like, this isn't for me anymore. Uh, and like, even to the point where I, I, I kind of fizzled it down. Then I started doing some like endurance teams on iRacing. And I've, that's still kind of going. I just, I, I don't want to be obligated to show up. I want to just, I want to race when I want to race, you know. Uh, I want to race yeah. specialty races. And the sponsors are letting me, like, I'm getting sponsors to let me do that. They're paying for this paint schemes, they're paying for the ride entries, you know. I don't pay a penny to race anymore. Um, that's good. Being retired, but so I, I'm semi-retired from iRacing, racing. Basically, being retired's gotten me more rides than when I was racing on iRacing. racing. Got me better rides, and it's a lot funner because you're racing for a sponsor. You're trying to go out there, and you're trying to be really good for that sponsor. So that next time they go, "Hey, we want you to race this race, this race, and this race," and that's what's happened. That some place finished at Auto Club, they loved me. They're like, that was great. You did a great climb through the field. I'm racing at Michigan on Sunday now. They want me to race at Michigan with their logos all over the race car. And they made me a brand new scheme. And they're like, oh, right before your birthday, you need to come and race Phoenix. You know? And oh, so cool. it, it's it's nice to get those sponsorships. It's uh, like it's sponsorships. They're just paying for me to race. I don't want to pay to race. You pay for my scheme. Right. You pay for the ride. You have, your, you have whatever you want on the car. I just want to have my scripture. Uh, and uh, my paw prints on my car. That's all I want. But it, it's kind of cool. I, I'm sure. I assume you pay to race, right? I mean, I pay. I, I, um, 
The only thing I pay for, obviously, is iRacing yeah. for them. And then I, like, Chop Shop, I think, is 20 bucks for the season. And, yeah. And then the other league I, I race is $35. The other leagues don't charge. Um, but those are selective leagues. So I, mean, I don't pay a whole lot. I mean, I do my own paints. That's um, good. Yeah. I, I, that's, part of the, that's part of the whole thing I enjoy, too, because I every time I sit down and, and do some paints or modify some paints that I figure out more stuff and new stuff, you know, and that's, I enjoy doing that a lot. In fact, I've had people now ask me to make them paints. And so I don't mind doing it. I just, yeah, just let me know, let me know kind of what you want and I'll make something for you. So I, I probably, I probably painted probably 10 different cars or something like that for people. Well, I don't I, charge them for it. I just, I just enjoy doing it, you know, and if they like it. It's, it's, it's cool. I just put my, Good Weiser Motorsports on the car. And that's, there you go. That was my gamer tag over Good on the box. Good nice. Weiser. Yeah, I was. Cool. I coined that phrase. I coined that phrase many, many, many years ago, <laughs> and that's why I brought <laughs> long it over time here. ago. <laughs> yeah, long time ago. Yeah. Oh man, yeah. Oh, this was a really good conversation. So let's kind of like we're gonna start winding down here. Uh, we talked yep. about your whole life here. Uh, there's plenty of young drivers in the league um, and a lot of guys who are taking this way too seriously. They come in here and it's got to, like, they got to win, they got to. What, what's the message you got for those drivers? Um, you got to be patient. You got to be patient and you have to, I mean, it's, this is what I always tell people. Drive it like you own it. Right? Mm-hmm. People that, the racers, when they go into a race and they, you know, and, and they have a fast repair, like, mm-hmm. I don't, the, I don't like the fast repair. I think the fast repair should not be there. And I understand that I'm going to be suffering from the no fast repair at some point, but that's reality. And so what I always tell people is just, Drive it like you own it and save your tires, save your fuel, you know, strategize. Don't just go out there with your foot on the floor. Like one of my teammates in one of the other leagues, he races this man. I, I keep, you know, when I take off, I keep spinning. Well, don't mash the pedal. Yeah. <laughs> Throttle control, simple. man. Come on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, drive it, drive it like you would drive a car, man. You have, you know, it's, you, but I don't know. Like I said, the inf- it's, there's two, there's an influx of younger people, and it's hard to get that across. You can tell too. I mean, there's when the, when there's teenagers or there's kids that are on the on the site. And, you know, some guy's running around and the name is Kathy Miller or something. Like you know that that's not that's their Kathy mom, Miller, yeah. right? That's their mom. <laughs> yeah, mommy's paying for this account. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that, it does get frustrating. And then you get the ones that are in those official sessions, and they just, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's gotten to the point where I go to official, I'm there to meme, all right? I'm doing Chili's ads just because, you know, it don't matter because it's better than listening to all those guys gab at each other, you know? Yeah. I'll do like a Chili's ad, and I'll go, it's buy one, get one if you use code Jimmy, shut up! If you use coach, <laughs> so you gotta have fun with it. I haven't done I haven't done an official race in probably a good couple of years. I think I don't do the officials anymore either. Like, yeah, uh, I don't know. I don't. That's why my rating doesn't change. Um, nothing changes, but I don't really care. Like I said, I I go into it. I I want to have fun. I want to have serious fun. Is what I call it. Right? Yeah. You know, I, I I haven't been racing much. I just do those few races that the sponsors do, and then onesies, twosies. Like I'm averaging like 1.7 races a month. That's it, and I'm oh, enjoying wow. it. That's what I and, and that's what I enjoy. I want to go on, dabble a little bit, have fun, do some competition. You know, a lot like I've started to come back to like the uh, Mormon Church, and so like it's uh that's been taking a lot of my time recently. But uh, but yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's certainly been interesting how i used to race like i was racing so much in 2023 as an iRacing champion and then i had a little bit of drama that happened 
and I kind of got over that. I was going to, I kept racing and then somebody was just a child and just was going off over nothing. And yeah. people were hitting me up saying, Hey, you need to apologize to this guy, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, he brought it on himself and all that drama was happening. I'm like, you know what? I'm done. I retired from every single league. I'm not doing the drama. And, you know, it kind of sucks. Uh, and so I understand, you know, the drama, I refuse to do it. What's nice about you is you're quiet enough. You don't even get into any of it. I don't do it. I don't. I, got I, won't, even, I won't even entertain a jab. I'll once in a while, I'll make a comment on, on, a, on the chat forum. I won't, mm -hmm. I won't make a comment over the air. But I'll make a comment over the chat forum, and I, pretty plain and simple. I mean, I, I, I only, I will only speak the truth. I'll only say exactly how I feel. You like it, you don't like it. You know, exactly. it's like whatever. So okay. um, I don't do that very often. It's just once in a while, I kind of feel like somebody, you know, somebody needs to hear it. Maybe exactly. it'll help. Maybe if it doesn't help, whatever. Maybe it'll help. It might help. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it might. Who knows? It might. Yeah. You go I don't know the, if I got through, uh, and I don't know if I got through the Jerry or not because I know. <laughs> it was, I mean, I wasn't being mean when I commented about it. I was just simply stating a fact that he ruined a lot of people's race. Man, he needs to apologize to people. You know, and I don't know if he took it serious or not. I don't. Even, I don't even know the guy, so it doesn't matter. It's like I said, it's in the past. Yeah, it, it, stuff happens. Um, accidents definitely happen for sure. Um, yep. and, uh, you know, we, we're all, uh, we're all trying to get better, but, uh, George, it's just been a great interview. Uh, it was good to talk yeah, to you. Definitely fun. learned a lot more about you. The furniture shells, man, guys, who knew you got like, you don't look quite 62. I was going to go like 52. That was right. where I was headed. Um, okay. you hold the age well, you know, well, thank you. You hold the age well, but we got one of the old guys here. You know, I love the old guys. I got this guy I race with, Asphalt Gator. You know, he is seventy-eight. He's nearly eighty. The dude can't figure out how to use his computer. It's it's bad. <laughs> but he's so much fun to race with. He served in the Navy in the in the seventies, oh, wow. uh, and like it's. Dude's old, but he's hilarious because he's like, I don't care what you think. And like, he just drives and he doesn't care. Like he'll wreck somebody. He goes, that's your problem. I'm just, I'm old. I'm going to get away with it. You know, <laughs> there you go. Whore. There you go, George. Next time you wreck somebody, just go, I'm old. I'm going to get away with it. Uh, it's not my wreck, fault. I'm I, old. You know, I'll tell you right now. I don't wreck people. <laughs> that's good. I, yeah, that's, I don't, I don't like, I don't wreck people. Uh, you can. If you had the opportunity to take a look at every race that I've entered, I don't wreck people. I don't think I've ever been accused of wrecking somebody. That's good. I can honest I can honestly say that. I know there was I know there was one race in Chop Shop that involved me and Stephen Hine. Mm -hmm. And in, in their races you have to like claim something. Yeah. We were running you know, we were we were running side by side and I don't know, something happened. I didn't claim it. He didn't claim it. I think it went to review. I know I didn't. I know I wasn't. Penalized. I know that nobody thought I did it. So I don't know yeah. if they, if they got Steven on it or if they just claimed it to be a racing deal. I don't. I don't remember. But yeah, I just I just don't wreck people. Like I said, that might be the reason that I'm more on the mid packer side because I don't take those chances mm. to, you know, and end up ruining somebody's race. I just. That's just not who I am. So, well, anyway. Well, folks, it was certainly a great interview, George. Uh, it was fun, yeah. Thank it you. was fun. Yeah. I can probably get a little better better uh, job on my side. We're going to try to do a little better for the next podcast. We're just going to keep, keep, keep getting better here, guys. This is Bryant Lucas, the Cowboy, here with George Rincon. Uh, great <laughs> interview. Learned all about his kids and uh, his racing. Got to hear his opinions and about, about, about racing on iRacing and – on the uh, about uh, racetracks and what he did as a kid, and it's been really a great interview. Uh, other than that, folks, this this it's a pleasure to be here doing chopping it up. 
Uh, Jason Day's interview was fantastic. We got another guy who's a father, two kids. I love these interviews because it helps me look at my parents and see what uh, how they grew up, how they raised me. You know, you look at that and those uh, opportunities that you get to talk about that father daughter son relationship and it's really important but uh folks thank you so much for tuning in uh chopping it up thanks you guys for watching uh i gotta thank everybody here at chopping it up uh striker hammond uh jason day for doing that podcast yesterday uh jorge and cone um uh, jerry culver dove uh Gerhalva. get in let's do your interview uh this thank everybody Everybody, you know, we appreciate you tuning in for chopping it up. Uh, just say uh, thank you. And uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Good night.